Hello and welcome back to CEO.ca. My name is James Fetham and today I am excited to be joined by Jeffrey Batcher, Executive Chairman of Rakovina Therapeutics. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. So let's kick things off. Can you give us a uh, 60 to 90 second elevator pitch for sure. Rakovina? Well, <clears throat> Rakovina Therapeutics is a company that we founded in 2021. Um, and the name Rakovina means cancer um, in Czech and some other Eastern European languages, which is, which is my background. And as we know, cancer affects everyone, either directly or one degree of separation with someone we know or in our family. And the challenge with it is cancer is a very smart disease. Uh, it's constantly evolving. Um, and that means that we have to constantly uh, innovate to stay ahead of it with new and better therapies. And, th and that's our focus. Um, the nuts and bolts of what we do is called DNA damage response. Um, and you know, mutations or defects in DNA damage response systems are involved in roughly three out of every four cancers. Um, the way that we are coming about this and, and tackling this is um, we have a collaboration uh, with a, an AI platform, uh, the team around the deep docking platform. We formed an alliance with them earlier this year that gives us exclusive access to was arguably one of the most robust um, drug discovery, medicinal chemistry, AI platforms in the world. And that gives us the opportunity for speed and breadth to look at a range of drug candidates, literally billions of drug candidates against the targets that we're interested in, in the DNA damage response space. Uh, and that's something that would be absolutely impossible without the use of the AI. So we use the AI to identify potential best-in-class drug candidates that we can then synthesize and bring into our laboratories for validation. Um, we can do that very quickly, literally in a matter of months rather than years. And from there, we'll look at partnering with larger companies to bring these into human clinical trials and hopefully make a very positive difference for patients. Great. Thank you so much for the overview, Jeffrey. There's a few points I'm going to pick up on there, but maybe let's start with the uh, DNA damage response. Can you explain the significance of that and, and why you pursued that as a, a target area for drug discovery? Sure. Um, well, DNA damage response, um, it, it's basically a set of systems that are naturally within our body, within our cells, and, and they are responsible for detecting and repairing damage to our DNA, which, which happens all the time. Uh, it can happen as a mistake when a cell is replicating a, a you know, small error that gets noted and, and fixed. Uh, it can also happen due to toxins or, or other insults on our body. So for example, if you're lucky enough to, to be in a place where the sun is shining and you, you know, are walking outside, you know, that UV light is hitting your, hitting your skin cells and causing damage, but you're not going to come back in with skin cancer that day because all that, that damage happened, those systems are seeing it, finding it and repairing it in real time. Happens tens of thousands of times a day. But what we've learned over many, many years of research is, as I said, roughly three out of every four cases of cancer involves a defect in one of those systems. And if that defect allows a mutation to sneak through that's involved in cell division or cell growth, eventually a tumor may form and that person is going to become a patient with cancer. That fact and that knowledge also gives us opportunities to target those defects with new therapies. And this has been coming along for literally decades of research in the first generation of products in this space called PARP inhibitors, P-A-R-P. Uh, those began to come into the market um, just a couple of years ago, um, over the last seven or eight years. And um, you know, they've been game changing for certain types of uh, breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer and, and have really improved the lives of those patients. And um, we are always striving to do better, so we're building upon that success ourselves and many others uh, to develop even new and better therapies. Great. Thanks for uh, for clarifying some of the details there. I guess also uh, in the elevator pitch, you mentioned that uh, you're operating with a collaboration with uh, this deep docking platform. Walk us through uh, what are the terms of that collaboration, uh, and I guess maybe how did, how did that deal come about in terms of using that technology to uh, apply to your own drug discovery? Well, the, the deep docking platform, as I said, is, is a very well-validated uh, AI platform that has been developed by a professor called 
Artem Cherkasov at the University of British Columbia. And Artis was at the forefront of computer-aided drug discovery for you know many years before that was really even in vogue. Um, and from this platform, there are multiple drugs in clinical trials, uh, the largest deal that's ever been done by a Canadian university and a big pharma company is, is a drug that came out of this platform. And we have the opportunity to use it exclusively for the targets that we are interested in. And Racobina Therapeutics will own the drug candidates that we identify through the platform. Um, how did we get so lucky and, and uh, to have this opportunity? Um, it, it's about relationships. Um, the president and chief scientific officer of uh, Racobina Therapeutics is uh, Professor Mads Dalgard, who is also at the University of British Columbia. And Professor Cherkasov happens to sit in the office next door. So as they you know, have uh, a very good relationship and have discussions about the ideal place to point that platform, um, yeah, DNA damage response, uh, one of the ideal scenarios is the fact that there's 30 plus years of research in this field that can be used to train that platform. And that's now allowed us to literally, uh, after our first target, screen billions of compounds in a matter of about 16 weeks, uh, something that would have taken a thousand chemists, 30,000 years to do. So it would have been impossible otherwise. And so, so now we have um, a short list of drug candidates that we uh, have in hand. We announced that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we're going through the process of synthesizing those uh, in the wet lab. Uh, validating them in uh, preclinical models, animal models, and then we'll look at uh, partnering opportunities from there. Great. I guess uh, you mentioned that you know this collaboration was was possible because of you know relationships from the Rakavina team. Could you walk us through maybe who are some of the other key team members, and I guess how did you all kind of come together to create this company? Well, it's uh, you know a mutual interest of people who have been working together for a long time. Um, you know, we actually started the company as a, a very traditional drug discovery and, and lead optimization company uh, in the DNA damage response field. And you know, through that, have developed a, a wonderful infrastructure at the University of British Columbia that we can use now to validate the lead candidates that are, that are coming out of the, the AI platform. Um, some of the key people around the table uh, on, in our advisory group, um, Professor Petra Hammerlich, who um, prior to rejoining the academic committee was, was actually the head of the DNA damage response programs at AstraZeneca, who's the leader in the field. They have the largest market position and have done great innovation. And you know, having the inside knowledge of, of such a leader in the field at our table is, is really uh, special and important to us, and we believe will enhance our success. Alongside of uh, Professor Hamelik, um, uh, also as an advisor to the company, is a fellow called Leonard Post. Um, Pfizer's drug uh, in the DNA damage response field, talazoprid, uh, their PARP inhibitor is actually Len's drug. Uh, he had that at uh, Lead Therapeutics. He took it to Biomarin. Eventually, uh, that program went to a company called Medivation, and Pfizer bought Medivation for $14 billion and uh, launched that drug. So um, we're very lucky and blessed to have a team that's worked together very well in the past and uh, some great advisors uh, in the field. Great. And I guess in terms of you know, moving from the discovery phase into you know, future commercialization. Are there any other kind of leading uh, drug candidates or product candidates that you're looking at at the moment? So like I said, we we have received now the, the short list of um, drug candidates um, for our first target. And our, our first target that we're going after is, is building upon the success of the three PARP inhibitors around the market. They're sold by Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and, and GSK, some of the largest uh, uh, drug and pharmaceutical companies in the world. And interestingly, none of those companies invented those products. They were acquired or licensed from smaller companies like us. Um, and you know, just like any uh, new technology, when it, when it comes into the market, it's paradigm shifting, it's game changing, um, but then we start to learn things. And you know, in this case, the PARP inhibitors are very important in the treatment of, as I said, certain types of breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. They'll do about three and a half billion dollars uh, in sales uh, this year collectively. But you know, there are some side effects associated with those programs, um, and you know, they're they lack some key abilities. For example, they're not very good at crossing the blood-brain barrier, and unfortunately, roughly about half of the breast cancer patients while undergoing treatment with these first generation products will will have the tumor spread to their brain and right now we can't 
do anything about that. And that is really the biggest driver of mortality in those indications now. So being able to reduce side effects and um, uh, cross the blood brain barrier is something that um, there's one company that looks like they have uh, a, a developing position there, which is AstraZeneca. And so what we've asked the AI uh, platform to do is to um, identify potential best in class drug candidates that are going to be as good or better than what the leaders in the field are currently doing. Um, and now we have that shortlist. So the next steps here are to synthesize those with our chemistry partner, a um, wonderful company in Vancouver called Farm Inventor. They will actually make the molecules for us. We will bring those into our laboratories at the University of British Columbia, uh, validate them, demonstrate that they do what they're supposed to do, uh, and then eventually look at partnering uh, with large, a larger company to move these into human clinical trials. Um, you know, we will be presenting some early data at the Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting uh, here in November of, of 2024, just in a, in a few weeks. Uh, from there, um, we'll begin having um, uh, some additional data and we'll look at major meetings like the American Association of Cancer Research annual meeting next spring to really showcase uh, our progress. And uh, we believe that those kind of data will drive opportunities for partnering. And in the DNA damage response field, um, we have seen multiple uh, licensing deals that are marquee in size for preclinical products. And when we talk about marquee in size, we're talking about you know deals valued of north of a billion dollars with um, upfront fees that are quite significant, around you know even around a hundred million uh, U.S. Um, in an upfront fee, non-dilutive capital. And and if we are successful in doing something like this, um, we will take that capital and use it to expand our infrastructure and really go after more of these targets in parallel. So. We're excited about where we are and, and what the opportunities are over the next 12 to 18 months. Fantastic. And I guess you know, when you are narrowing in from uh, you know, all these uh, available molecules or potential kind of drugs out there, and you're using kind of this AI partnership to select a, a kind of final round candidates, what is the process like between now, you know, when you have that short list? and potential clinical trials. How are you narrowing down uh, those options? Right, well, you, you start with a, it's, it's almost like a funnel. You know, the first question is, um, you know, how selective are we against the target that we're interested in, which is PARP1? Um, there are actually 11 PARP enzymes in the body and the first generation drugs tend to hit more than one of them. And it's it's now believed that the side effects that are associated with these are are because of this sort of off-target hitting of other other PARP enzymes. And so being PARP1 selective versus anything else is the first question we'll ask. And, and we'll look at this short list and we'll rank the best ones. Uh, and then from there, uh, the, the key thing is um, the potential for brain penetration and being able to treat a cancer that's metastasizing um, to the brain. And we'll assess based on that. And so the list will, will be narrowed um, from the best parameters uh, of what we've asked the AI to deliver. Um, the AI says these are the, the most likely candidates uh, to hit all the marks, and then we will actually take them in a lab and and do the further ranking and selection based on that. Great. And Jeffrey, just to wrap up today, I guess for any uh, potential investor who might be watching the video, learning about Rakavina, in your view, uh, what sets you apart from the competition? What What's Rakavina's unique value proposition? And I guess also, why is now an interesting time for investors to pay attention? Well, I, I think what, what sets us apart, I mean, AI has become you know, quite a buzzword and you know, we do not consider ourselves an AI company. Um, the AI is a tool, but the star of the show and what's going to build value for investors and impact the lives of patients are the drug candidates that are coming out of the AI. And what gives us a leg up on the competition, we believe, is the, the robust nature of the platform that we are working with. Um, this is a platform that in three, uh, the lower three weeks was able to screen uh, about 1.3 billion compounds against the COVID virus um, back in the early days of the pandemic. And Professor Cherkasov um, published that online, said, you know, this is my, my contribution to the world, to a problem we're trying to solve. And that led to multiple programs. Uh, and we uh, understand had an influence over uh, Pfizer's decision to to advance Paxlovid. So, um, you know, that robustness is now what we have uh, access to specifically and uh, 
uh, with uh, exclusivity against our uh, our targets. And we believe that that gives us a leg up on on competition to get to that next in best best in class drug candidate. Um, and interestingly, those those potential competitors are also you know partnering customers, if you will, and the kind of folks that we're going to want to work with. Uh, so we, we are looking to deliver to patients and to those partners exactly what we know they're looking for and do that in a very cost efficient and family manner. Excellent. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for giving us an overview of Racavina today. Uh, looking forward to more updates uh, over the coming months. Thank you so much.